Okay, right. Uh, I'll be talking about my project BCP and a more general feature, large projects versus memory. So uh, let's get sharing the screen. Don't worry, there's no more of that. <laughs> this is a story of um, a big project and running out of memory and how to solve it. And a bit of help from the cat over there. Um, so BCP was originally a project. I didn't think it was gonna be possible. I was trying to prove it was impossible to do printed circuit board design on an unexpanded BBC micro without a second processor, which I'd seen mention of PCB design systems on the B, but they all use a second processor. And I thought, is it possible without? It can't be possible, surely. So I tried to prove that it wasn't possible and ended up thinking that it was possible. So I started writing a printed circuit board design program on the BBC Micro. Called it BCP, standing for Backer Cigarette Packet, Standard Designer's Tool, and also it spells PCB backwards. And uh, in the course of doing this, I started running out of memory because obviously any big project is going to run out of memory. Uh, what I tried to do in the beginning was to split it up into chunks. So there'd be a graphics chunk and a database chunk and eventually a design program chunk. I was testing it as I went along. And what I was doing was each chunk would have a, a basic source code program that would generate the assembled code and then start save it with a reload address. And then the important entry point that I wanted to export to the next chunk would be, um, I have a, bunch of data statements at the end of the program and I'd print out the star spool file that I could star exec into another program that would redefine the variables that I you know picked up as labels in the first program and um <sighs> sorry um sorry I'm losing my place I um so I got my list of variables and exported them. This meant that when I edited the program, obviously I had to star exec in the variable dump from the previous program, make all my changes, I had to edit the data statements at the end. And it got to be a little bit of a mess. And I was doing all this under BBAM until I started, hold on. Um, I'm going to have to go on, on Zoom. Sorry about that. I got interrupted. Don't worry. We, we can edit that out. Easy peasy. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Um, right. Next slide. We're doing stuff under emulation. I started developing some host side tools to make the task a little bit easier. For instance, to remove line numbers from a basic program. Well, actually, the first tool I wrote was something called DFS Buster, which would take a DFS disk image and actually extract the programs on the PC in a form that could be edited on the PC and then um, create a DFS image that would load back into BBAM. And I was doing this for a while and I would load in a basic source code. I, by this time, I'd got a tool to pick out all the labels and create the data statements for the end of the program for the variable export. And that worked quite well. But I found it was still cramping my style a little bit. And then I discovered 
a really good host side tool. Bebay SM. Now this is the absolute best thing there is. I can't recommend it highly enough. If you're doing development for the Beeb, it's worth using Beeby SM. It's a, a brilliant piece of software. And uh, yeah, can't recommend it highly enough. The syntax is just like the BBC Micro. You can literally take the code from the Beeb, chop out the line numbers, put it into Beeb ASM, which is a few directives that aren't quite the same as the Beeb. It will assemble your code, produce a DFS disk image that you can load into BBM, and it's excellent. You might say, well, now you've heard the hit record, you can all go home. But uh, of course, there's more to it than that. Because now we hit an existential crisis. If I'm developing the code in BBASM, all on the host side, but only exporting it to the target side, the question is, am I still really developing a BB app? Or am I developing a PC app that happens to use a fancy runtime that's a BBC emulator. And I thought, if I get too deep down the BBASM rabbit hole, yeah, it's great I'm developing on that, but what if somebody, you know, has got a real Beeb and wants to type this in from scratch? They should be able to do that. And so um, I started having a bit of a rethink. back to the target side. And I took my VBASM code and tried to put it back into my original framework with the data statements for the variables I wish to export, but it was just too big by this stage. I've got now four sections of program rather than just two. And it was getting out of hand. So what actually started me thinking was when I got it to assemble, but the variables were too big to actually export. So I deleted the variable export code and it built and uh, saved, that was fine. I just couldn't pass on the variables to the next program. So back to the host side and created something a bit like the export portion. But what I did was, instead of creating a program that just read its variables and dumped them out, I created a program that would take whatever variables were in memory and just print them to a star spool file. So star spool and star exec at the same time, read one file. It's got a series of immediate mode commands that will print the variable's value. And that will go into the star spool file Obviously the command will have a more than sign in front of it, the basic prompt. So that'll give you a syntax error, but at least when you star exec that, it will star spool out the file with the variables in. A lot of errors, but it does recover the variables. And that got me setting, thinking about the next thing, a target side tool. That's not right. Target side tool to actually dump out the variables from BASIC's own variable database. Now, the way that BASIC stores its variables is a bit awkward. At this point, I've got the BDEM running. I'm actually going to show you a little demo program. So, All this is, is a bit of a basic program to show the contents of memory. So let's see. Let's have a look at the, the program and some bytes after it. Let's go for 128 bytes. That's the beginning of the program that you can see there. And if we look, 
at the end of memory after the program. F1. Uh, you can see part of the previous program. Um, before uh, sorry about this Third time's the charm. You'll see that in the variable storage area, you've got the names of the proc and function in the program. Now, if we define a variable, say, and we're looking here now, You'll see the end of the variable name, L-U-E, and there's a zero, and there's eight three zero 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 zero. That is actually the value that we defined as a floating point number, which work a little bit like resistor color codes, apart from with five bands and 256 colors. Well, based on this and checking the format of storing variables in memory and dumping in memory and seeing what was there, I realized it was possible actually to write a program to dump out the variables from memory. And uh, that's what I've actually got going. Um, let's have a look. This is the um, build process. I'm actually going to show you now, running through the whole thing. We'll not have page mode on, but we will show the assembled code. Now, when this runs, the first thing it does is it sets up the workspace variables. What it's doing is that was dumping out the variables from memory. This is reading them back in again in immediate mode, because that way you've not got two copies of the variable definition, one in the program and one in the internal database. And uh, you've just got one copy in the internal database. This is now going through the various stages and it's just doing the first assembly pass. What it does is, obviously, when you're doing an assembler program, you do the first pass, it picks up the variables, and then you do a second pass for the actual assembly. And we just do, for each part of the program, we've got a basic source that assembles it. First run, first run it does just one pass. And it writes the variables it's picked up from that into a big file. You can see the variable file being written now. That's growing as new variables are defined. That's the last stage now. It's going to go back to the beginning and it's going to do the math library first. It's reading in the variables. They're finalized now. This time it's going to do two assembly passes. 
and it's picked up all its own local variables. Now it's picking up, it's doing the actual assembly. Because what happens, there's two kinds of variables in there. There's some that you want to export to your next program, and there's some that are just only really needed, say, for a loop or something. You're only going to reference them once. You don't want to export those. So what my variable dump program does is anything that starts with an underscore or a pound sign, it decides is a local variable that's not to be exported. Uh, so if I stop there, you can see underscore tidy one, because that label is not going to be exported. And you've got others like save underscore RT vertex, that saves the root vertex. That's an entry point that you might need to call from elsewhere, so we don't start that with an underscore. You might see that some of them start with real. That's because I've got a static jump table in there as well. I've got things like real post save, which is called from post save. It's just a thing I started using BBSM, started putting in static jump tables and everything uh, because everything was coming through in one chunk with BBSM. It wasn't like being locally assembled. I didn't get all my labels as basic variables. So I used a static jump table. So I'd have the variables defined just once, no matter how big the program was getting. And uh, this is coming to the end of the build process now. This is the final stage, which actually stitches together all the code and saves it. Ah, no, this is the last stage. This is the um, design application. It's also the longest. And uh, when that's done, it will stitch the code together. That's the last export of variables. Now, all done. Um, We've now got all the machine code files saved on there. And there's a file called all code with all the code in it. That's everything. Those minimal list of variables are l.minvars. And now let's go back to our previous program. So, um, uh, let's actually go back to there. Um, let's have a look at the anatomy of one of the program stages. We'll look at the maths library. All the programs are fairly similar. We've got a bit of a preamble at the beginning, which is obviously putting it into mode seven and setting high mem. And we define a function key, inject that into the keyboard buffer, and we end. Now what's going to happen then is, once we're back in basic, it will do that star exec l dot vars carriage return and then go to 100. And here's where the next bit happens. We set some variables up. This is the page mode on or off. And then for j% percent equals 4 to 7 step h% percent, H percent starts off as being four. So it will start with J percent as four, then it'll go to eight and break the loop. The second time around, H percent will be either two if we don't want the listing or three if we do. And it will go either four, six or four, seven. We need to run it with opt for the second time, just so we can pick up all the local variables that we never exported. Then we set O percent and P percent, and the code starts here.
it'll be the same process for any code. So I'll not dwell too much on the code for now. At the end of the code, we do a next J percent and that will do the next pass on the second time around or stop straight away the first time around. If we're on our first time through, we run proc EV, which exports the variables. Then we print the Slack space and we define save command. And if we are on the second pass, we actually run that save command. Then chain, chain load the next program. That ends a bit redundant because you're not going to hit that if you chain load something else, but never mind. And here's our proc EV, the actual variable export. Uh, it's a program that I wrote. As I said, it dumps the basic variables from memory. L% percent is a variable that it uses. If that's zero, it doesn't put line numbers on. If it's non-zero, then it puts line numbers on, increasing by 10 each time. We might want to export O% percent and P%. Percent. We um, create a spool file. Star B dump is the actual program itself. We also pass out underscore begin so that the next program in the chain can test and make sure that the previous one hasn't overrun it because for historical reasons I started at the top and worked downwards towards the bottom. Um, let's also have a look at, I've done some diagrams of what's actually going on in memory. So I'll do that. This is the workspace program. And we see you've got memory there, zero, zero to 8,000. This would be the screen. It runs in mode four. Uh, we'll obviously run in mode one, two, nine, and a master. And then in mode seven, you get your screen up here. This bit is where the variables will be stored eventually. What this does is program there, variables there, and that's the actual assembled code it produces, just literally a workspace full of mostly zeros and some initial values. The maths library has got all this much basic to produce this much code and this much variables. The database stuff, well, we've got this much basic for this much code. Again, now the variables are grown to this. It's got its own entry points. Graphics adds a few entry points. Again, you've got the similar sort of ratio of code size to source size. And then you've got the design app, which is beginning to push things now. We're getting towards the limits here. And I'm gonna to have to split that into two at some stage in future. But what I'm hoping to do now is because I've got this process, and it works, then um, I can go back to using BBSM for the primary development and know that any time I can convert the BBSM source back to native Beeb style source code that will build on a real Beeb or an emulated Beeb and not need a PC. You know, in theory, you could take the disk image, transfer it, to an SD card or a real floppy disk and put it into a real Beeb and run it that way and build the stuff actually natively on a real Beeb. And uh, that's the um, future direction. So if anybody wants to um, 
ask any questions. Obviously, I'm totally prepared to share the code because progress isn't worth much unless it's shared. Um, and Yeah, where it's going next. Well, when BCP is a bit further developed, as I said, under BASM, I will produce a BEEB native buildable version of it. And the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the same build process to do something completely different. I wanna write a game that's gonna access hardware directly. So I've been doing everything street legal with BCP so that it can run on a master or a BEEB or a second processor without any changes. Uh, but the next thing I say, I want to write a game and do something naughty. So I've done too much street legal code for one project. So uh, the next thing is going to be a game and it'll be natively buildable on the Beeb because I'll be able to break it up and uh, assemble it with my special build process and my variable export tool. So yeah, that's it. Uh, anyone got any questions? Uh, not really a question, just really liked it. Thanks. The way that you can throw away all the variables you don't need to keep. Yeah, it's, uh, you've got to work out what you do and don't need to remember. That's the way you do it. I mean, I was, at one stage I was considering assembling the code over the basic source, but that just gives you bad program errors. Not recommended. Um, the variable dump program, we did some discussion of that on the board. Uh, if you want sources for that or DFS Buster or any of the scripts, hit me up. They should be just about linked from my GitHub if you know where that is. That's on the um, startup forums, the link there under BCP. Um, but yeah, that's it. And yeah, the next thing will be a game and I'll write that all in BBASM and then port it to native on the Beeb. And uh, let's let my phone now, have some attention. Spook, say hello to everyone. Will your game work on the uh, Electron also, Julie? Um, I'm hoping just to develop it on the Beeb first of all, I'm not going to do anything that's going to be too Beeb hardware specific, I don't think. So it should run on Electron. Right. Um, I haven't paid too much mind to the Electron's hardware. Can you do things like uh, doing a 256 byte wide screen on the Electron? Does that do that? No, you cannot really change the resolution like that, like you can on the Beeb. There's um, no CRTC uh, chip. No, I didn't think so. I, mean, I know the Electron's got a ULA that does the video, but just wants to show how much of the 685 yeah. stuff yeah. emulated. And it's only two interrupts a frame, isn't it? Yeah, um, there's, there's only two real interrupts uh, besides the tape interrupt, of course, but you have the uh, vertical sync, display end interrupt, and you have the one at the RTC, real-time clock uh, interrupt at scan line 100. Uh, that's all you got. You know, no programmable timers or whatever. <laughs> so, Sounds like an interesting challenge then. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I was lucky. I never actually had an electron, so um, I didn't have to bother too much about making things work on it. Yeah, right. Yeah. But yeah, I liked your stuff anyway, the electron and the... Beeb, I mean, it's good how you've got the, especially the one binary that works on everything with the different hardware and everything. I was cheating by using the OS. Yeah, thanks. Um, basically, uh, yeah, uh, I'm doing all the naughty things that you are uh, thinking about doing in your game next, so. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So much clean stuff. Yeah. All, all proper plots and yeah, inky and everything. Oh, I skipped that a long time ago. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I think uh, I might have to uh, get up soon and give this little 
I found a little bit of cat food. Are you planning on using PC tools or or um, BBC tools for sprites and stuff for your game? Uh, a little bit of both. I've got BBC side tools that I've used. Um, I might do something with uh, PC based tools because it's quite easy. You can just take an image and then you can read the pixels of it as an array. So that's uh, kind of cool. Uh, I've uh, played about with uh, taking graphics files already. Although as I say, I wrote some stuff on the target side, so I might end up still using that for the sprite design. Uh, yeah, it's very tempting on the PC because you can rebuild all your assets, assemble all your code, build an image and run the emulator up in about two seconds. Yeah. <laughs> It's a bit, a bit slow doing it on the emulator, but I got my little money and flip flops running across the screen. That's a, a clue to what might be in the game. Is it likely to be an original game or a conversion? It would be a kind of a kind of parody of another game and using a borrowed asset from another Beeb game. I can't really say too much about it, and um, it's. Definitely set in a completely fictitious place that is not on the south coast between Kent and Hampshire. So, uh, yeah, any any rumours about it being anywhere in Sussex and certainly not in Brighton are exaggerations. Okay, that's all I'm saying about it. <laughs>